apologies about the quiz this weekend. It was, uh, we usually make a bunch of new questions. It's, it's very tiring every week. And uh, we use, reuse questions from the last semester. About, so it's something like 70, 30, 70 from last semester, or uh, older questions, 30% new questions. And that 70 app just happened to include questions from a guest lecture that we had in the same week last semester. And uh, we thought we'd clean them out, but you know, when you're selecting 15 out of 20 questions, some of them get through. So you saw some bizarre things. And the difficult bit was the guest lecture was on a topic that's really not generally covered in the, cl in, in the class. So you had strange questions about, uh, I don't know, meta learning and whatnot, which were not only not covered, they're not going to be covered. I mean, it's not part of our uh, standard syllabus. So uh, there was no way I could actually let the quiz go because we are, we are going to be uh, we are asking questions that you're not going to, that have no relevance to the class. So anyway, the TAs were up till 7.30 a.m., believe it or not, trying to get the latest homework out. Uh, as usual, we have uh, problems. Canvas is a problem. We know this by now. And Canvas has this nasty habit that if you open a question and make some edit and save it, some other question in the quiz loses an answer or loses some figures or uh, bizarre things happen, which means editing these things is really scary because you never know what else you're destroying. And typically, when we post these quizzes, I and my TAs go over it three or four or five times to make sure everything is fine. And then you know, in your panic, you know, you open it once more and you save it and something changes. <laughs> uh, it's bad. And we didn't actually verify this week's quiz, which meant not, not only did you have blank choices in some questions, uh, you had wrong questions. Anyway. Uh, getting on with the subject, I'm going to pick up where we left off. I'm not going to be able to go through all of this today, so hopefully on Friday we will uh, record an extra lecture uh, the, uh, and uh, post the last of these uh, lectures in this series on Friday. Now, what, we, uh, what we've seen so far, we were looking at, uh, we're looking at sequence to sequence modeling, and we've seen that sequence to sequence networks, which irregularly output symbols can be decoded using Viterbi decoding. They require alignment uh, of the output uh, 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 to the symbol. Uh, the uh, alignment of the target symbol sequence to the inputs. And uh, you can train these things by iteratively estimating this alignment using something like Viterbi decoding, and then, and then updating your model on the aligned input. Or you can optimize the expected error over all possible alignments. This is where we left off. But somewhere in between, we actually missed or left aside a key decoding problem, that of repeating symbols. So let's say you have a decode, which goes R, 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 O, 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 D, right? Now, I can collapse the repetitions. But then when I collapse the repetitions, there are two different words that I can actually form out of this. I mean, some of the examples you'll see are kind of weird simply because maybe I wasn't creative enough in coming up the, with the words, but you see the problem, right? Here, I can, depending on uh, how you collapse it, you can form two different words. Which one do you choose? So this is, we've seen this before, right? If I were to, do, if I were to perform a greedy decode of this guy, then you have this sequence of four uh, repetitions of a symbol in the middle for four repetitions of f. And you collapse that to two f's, three f's, four f's, or is it just one f? How do you know? That information is missing, right? So to get around this, uh, we are going to uh, look at some solutions. So once again, here's the problem. You have the uh, uh, a problem where the output symbols, in this case, we are assuming characters, they could repeat. Uh, they repeat in your alignment. We have no idea of, no way of knowing uh, how to collapse them, how many symbols to collapse them into. Now, not every situation where you have repetition, uh, uh, in, in not every decoding problem, 
will you have this uh, particular uh, possibility. So consider what we did in homework one. In homework one, we were decoding phonemes. And when we were decoding phonemes, what we actually decoded was not entire phonemes. What we did, the, uh, the, your targets were parts of phonemes. So for each phoneme, you had three possible targets. The first, the, the, uh, the first uh, segment of the phoneme, which was, which was the first state, or the, or the central portion, or the trailing portion. Now in that case, if I see repetitions of a symbol, it's unique because the, uh, when you collapse things, it's always going to be the first portion of a phoneme, the second, and then the third. And if the phoneme must repeat, then you, the, the first portion of the, uh, the uh, you, you actually have to go through stage one, stage two, and stage three before repeat returning to stage one. And so if you ever see something like uh, S1, 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 S2, S2, S3, S3, you, you would never collapse it to S1, S2, S3, S3, because this cannot happen, right? If you want to collapse it to a phoneme, this is the phoneme, so then the next one would have to be S1. So there are situations where you don't have problems of this kind. But more generally, this is a problem. You will not know whether the repetitions must be collapsed to one symbol or two, or how many they must be collapsed to. And so to deal with this, we will introduce an extra symbol whose only job in life is to separate repetitions of symbols. This is the blank. So uh, the blank is the equivalent of saying nothing is happening here. Right? Now, for instance, if I were going to, if I were aligning some input, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, Typically, if you wanted an output, maybe you wanted an A here, a B here, and a C here. What we did in these cases was to sort of repeat the symbol. We said this was an A as well, this was a B as well, this was a B as well, this is a C, right? But what you're really saying is there's nothing happening here. There's nothing of note here. These guys don't really matter, right? This. These are nothings. So our blank, so instead of repeating our symbols, we will introduce the equivalent of a nothing symbol. Nothing is happening in a symbol, which is the blank. Now, as always, uh, you can always have, the, the issue is this, it's not so trivial. If it were this trivial, I would have introduced this the first thing in the class. But that's really what we're, the, you can have these other situations. I can have nothing A, Okay, nothing A, nothing B, B, nothing C. And this doesn't mean that there are two repetitions of B. It means that it's a single B, right? So the nothing, which means that symbols can repeat, and when they repeat, they can be collapsed. The nothings can repeat. When they repeat, they can be collapsed. So how, the, how, how we will distinguish between two repetitions of a symbol and two distinct repetitions of a symbol and just one instance of a symbol is by introducing the, by, by having some very simple rules. So consider the blank. A blank's job in life is to ensure that distinct symbols are kept separate. It occurs, the symbols that occur on either side of a blank are distinct. So here, for example, this A is distinct from the B. And the B is distinct from a C. So we will be collapsing repetitions and uh, symbols that occur on either side of the blank are basically going to be uh, to be actual symbols that you're outputting, except that if there are repetitions, you're only going to be outputting the last one. So here, uh, consider this blank sequence, this RRR blank blank uh, o, o, blank, blank, D, 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 right? I begin collapsing everything. So when I collapse everything, the first three R's is going to, going to become an R. The next two O's are going to become an O. And the last three D's are going to become a D. So the whole thing collapses to R blank, O blank, D. I get rid of the blanks, now it's going to be R O D. 
right? Now, the second case, the same thing is happening, but then the first two R's are going to collapse to a single R. So what the second case is actually going to collapse to is going to be R uh, and then what happens is a blank and there's an R, there's a blank and there's an O blank D blank D, right? This is what it collapsed to in the second case, is it right? And so that's actually going to become R, R, O, D, D. See what we're talking about? See, see how this works? Right? So in the third case, for instance, I have three instances of R, but between the R's I have blanks. So if I collapse it using the same rules where I say that I will collapse repetitions of any symbol, right? That is going to collapse to R hyphen R hyphen R, and then you have three blanks which I'm going to collapse into one, and then I have uh, an O, and then I have a blank, and then I have an O, then I have several repetitions of D, two repetitions of D, a blank, then four repetitions of D, a blank, and a D. So this actually is going to become three R's, O, O, D, D, D. Is that what I have out there, right? So you see, you see how this works. The blank is your nothing happens here symbol. You're allowed to introduce a nothing happens here symbol. And after you introduce a nothing happens here symbol, from your align sequence, you will still use the same rules as before. You're going to collapse repetitions. But now you actually have the ability to clearly distinguish between two distinct instances of a character and instances of a character that must be collapsed into one. Because when you have two distinct instances of a character, there will be a blank in between. Otherwise, there will be no blank, right? So make sense to everybody, right? So for example, if I had, let's just try this. Maybe you, uh, let's, uh, I'll give you another example and you can tell me what this collapses to. So let's say I have a, a, a hyphen A, B hyphen B B. What would this collapse to? A, B. This is going to be A, A, B, B, right? And now, suppose, so, so you get the idea, right? Now, keep the, there are two distinct things over here. I want you to keep in mind that there are two distinct things over here, okay? One, or actually three distinct uh, entities. Earlier, when we were aligning things without the blank, you had two distinct entities. The two distinct entities were the aligned sequence and the compressed sequence, right? So when you had the aligned sequence and the compressed sequence, you had things like A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 and this got compressed to A, B, C, right? So this is the order synchronous compressed sequence, the, and the upper one is the time synchronous sequence that it ex expanded into, right? Now, when I actually introduce the blanks, I'm going to have something like A, A, A hyphen A, A, B, B hyphen C. So this is the time synchronous sequence where you have one symbol per output, okay? But then when I collapse repetitions, this is going to become A hyphen A, B hyphen C, right? This is no longer time synchronous. This is just an order synchronous sequence. And this order synchronous sequence further collapses to A, A, B, C. So you see the three-step process? By introducing these blanks, we introduce this intermediate notation that allows us to, uh, allows us to uh, handle repetitions of characters. Now, introducing this actually introduces a certain problem, which is to say, let's say I have A, B, C, D, that's at this level, right? Then at this level, what are the different ways in which I can represent it? Anyone? Yeah. 
So the simplest is going to be, well, A, B, C, D is the simplest, right? What, what other option could I have? So no, if I have, I'm speaking of this level, at this level, the intermediate level. What are the other options I can have? Just blank before and after. So I can just have something A, B, C, D, blank. This works too, correct? But I can also have A, blank, B, C, D. I can have A, B, blank, C, D. There are any number of options because I can, I'm allowed to introduce blanks between any two characters. Now this is not time synchronous, this is order synchronous, but those blanks are really nothings, right? Their job is to separate symbols in life. Now what, we'll have, what we are going to do is to work not off this level, we are going to work off this level. Okay, and how can I, can I represent all of these compact different ways of having a blank into, the, uh, into this notation, into the intermediate notation. To represent that, to show, to, to, uh, show you how this works, I'm going to represent the sequences as a graph. All right? So when I say A, B, C, D, uh, this is, I'm going to be, I'll, I'll make nodes, A, B, C, D. So without the blanks, this is my graph. That represents my compressed sequence, but this graph represents every way. If any path from the beginning of the graph to the end of the graph will generate repetitions, it's going to generate for me a, a uh, uh, aligned sequence, right? Expanded sequence, okay? So I'll just use the shorthand notation for this guy, and I'm going to say, I'm going to say that I can have an A, A can go to a B, B goes to a C, and C goes to a D, right? But now suppose I want to introduce blanks. Then I can I have ways of doing this. This is at the, at the intermediate level. I can say A goes to a blank uh, to B, but then A can also go to a blank and then go to a B. Both of these become, these are two options, right? Or to write it slightly differently, I can say I have blank A, blank B, blank C, blank D, blank, and then this is your dummy initial one, the dummy final one, and I can have these guys. So this graph actually represents every possible way of representing A, B, C, D at the intermediate level. Does that make sense to everyone? Have we actually got this graph, right? But then now if I have a repetition of a character, Suppose so this was A, B, C, D, right? If I have a repetition of a character like A, B, B, C. In this case, if I'm trying to make a graph, I have a blank A, blank B, blank C, blank B, blank C, right? Then if I have a repetition of this graph, I'm going to have this guy. And then I'm going to actually have this one, this one, this one, and this one, which rep represents all possible options. But I cannot have a skip from a B to a B. Because I have a skip from a B to a B, that's like having two repetitions of B, they would get collapsed to one B, right? So in the intermediate representation, I can, this, when, when, when we introduce this blank-based interme intermediate representation of this kind, we actually end up with a rule which allows you to separate repetitions of a symbol B, right? So the only, per going back over here, the, uh, so the purpose of introducing this whole blank is, the, is that the blank separates out repetitions of characters, but the blank by itself is a nothing character. There's really nothing 
it doesn't really represent anything by itself, right? So now, in order to be actually able to uh, generate these aligned, uh, so, uh, so the uh, aligned sequences with blanks in them, the output vocabulary of the network must now introduce, include this extra symbol, which is the blank. And so here, for instance, if my vocabulary has only six phonemes, the network is not going to be outputting six phonemes, it's actually going to be outputting seven, seven symbols. The seventh one is the blank. It's the I'm not doing anything symbol, right? And then over here, so let's say I'm looking at I'm trying to produce this sequence of casts of phonemes B, phi, right? Then an aligned sequence of this kind, what does this represent? If the, if the, if the uh, sequence of phonemes I picked up were the ones circled by boxes, by the red boxes, what is the actual compressed sequence being represented here? It's exactly B, phi, right? The first burr gets collapsed. I have two Bs, one after the other. They're going to get collapsed to one. I have two Es. They're going to get collapsed to one. The four Fs are going to get collapsed to one. And the E is going to get collapsed to one, right? So that's B phi. Now, on the other hand, suppose I have something of this kind. What does this collapse to? Again, the blank doesn't matter. So then it's going to B, E. Again, the blanks don't matter for and E, right? So it's still beefy. But then now suppose I have something of this kind. What does it get collapsed to? The first blank doesn't matter. Then you have the burr, right? The two E's will collapse. Then you have F. But then you have a blank in between. So the next fur is unique. It's distinct. And then E. So now we are going to have two repetitions of fur. So the blank actually permits you to introduce uh, repetitions of a symbol, OK? Now, going back to how we actually were aligning things when we were trying to align a given target sequence to the input. Remember what we did. We pulled out the, output, the, the, the uh, uh, rows from the output probability matrix, which corresponded to those four symbols in this case, or to the symbols in, the, in our target output, and concatenated these rows in order to create the table on top. And then in the table on top, we, we showed every possible path from going to, the, from the, to, to go from the top left corner to the bottom right corner. And every possible path guaranteed that this was going to be just exactly beefy, right? But this is not, this is without blanks. But now if I have to introduce this uh, blank character, which permits me to have repetitions, right? What I will do is to do exactly what I did here. I'm going to introduce blanks between every two symbols and on every side, right? See, see what I'm doing over here? So we're not working at the bottom compressed level, fully compressed level. We are not working at the top fully expanded level. We are working at the intermediate level where, where this nothing symbol is possible between symbols. And that is the level at which we're, you know, this, we're, we're going to compose our graphs. And now, if I look at, if I plot the, the edges, which show me all permitted paths, that's going to be this. This is the graph. So observe what happens. I'm basically having, I have, uh, we have beefy over here, right? I want to have every way of generating, oh, it's not beefy, I think it's two E's over here. So I want B, E, E, F. I want every possible way of generating beef. So which means that, and the simplest way, the most expanded way is this guy, right? But then I can skip the blank over here. And uh, I can skip this blank over here. But I cannot skip this blank, right? 
So if you look at this one over here, or if you take any path from the top to the bottom, it's going to be one of these paths. So you say that from the initial blank, you can go to the burr, or you can continue producing an initial blank. So there are two arrows going down. Then from the burr, you can continue producing a burr, which is to say you stay over here, or you can go to the E, or, uh, to the, or you can go to the blank, or you can go to the E. So there are three arrows coming out of the burr. Observe that you cannot, you, you never have connections from a blank to a blank, because if you do, then you're, you're skipping a character, right? You're working in this intermediate level. So on the blank row, there are always only two outgoing edges. Either you continue producing blanks, or you go to the next symbol. And then for E over there, now E again, you can either continue producing E's, or you can go to the blank, but we are not allowed to go from the E and skip to the E because this, this jump is not permitted. This jump would mean a repetition of that the two, the, the two repetitions are going to get collapsed. Right? So you, get, you understand how this thing works. And so, uh, the, and then finally, so, so here are all the characteristics. You can begin with a blank, or you can begin with the actual symbol itself. You can begin with the, end with the blank or the symbol. And these are the skips. So every time you have a, you're permitting a skip, those blue arrows show you the, show, show you the corresponding transitions that permit those skips. So you see exactly how this whole graph was formed, the trellis was formed. And every path in the graph from the top left to the bottom right is a unique and exact, I mean, is an exact uh, alignment of B phi to the input, which may or may not have blanks in it, right? And so once we compose this graph, so uh, the first and last columns are also allowed to have end at initial and final blanks. Skips are permitted across a blank, but only if the symbols on either side are different. Uh, and that is because, and because a blank is mandatory between repetitions of a symbol, but not required between distinct symbols, uh, you don't have the skip between the two copies of E. For those, you actually need the mandatory blank. And so here I have a little bit of a, a pseudocode which actually explains how the, uh, uh, how the graph is uh, composed. I'm going to skip the pseudocode over here, but uh, later on we'll spend, when we look at uh, beam decoding, we'll spend a little time with the pseudocode. So anyway, here is the, now, now that we've composed a somewhat different graph, remember how we did the forward-backward algorithm? We pulled out the rows corresponding to the symbols in our target output created a table, created a graph from it, and ran the forward-backward algorithm on this, ta on, on this graph. Now, uh, look at this one here, right? This is the new graph. And for this new graph, this is going to be the, uh, uh, the these, these are the, all of the arrows, the, all of the paths, valid paths. And we really want to be computing the forward-backward graph on, the, on this modified version of the graph with the blank rows in, there, in it, okay? So at the very first time instant, if I'm running just the forward algorithm, I can have uh, the, the first symbol, the first input can be aligned either to the initial blank or to the first symbol. So you're going to have alpha values for both of those guys. And those alpha values are simply going to be the corresponding output probabilities for the, for those two symbols, right? Now at the next time, and so because at the first time, all the blacked out boxes are not allowed, they cannot be aligned to the first symbol, they will be assigned zero probability, right? Now, here's how you're gonna iterate it. At the subsequent times, the alpha, there are, two kinds of, uh, there are two kinds of nodes in the graph at subsequent times. Some nodes have two parents, some nodes have three parents. 
any node which represents which is on a blank uh, which is uh, uh, on a blank row has only two parents observe because a blank can repeat or you can get into a blank from the previous character right so that means that uh, if the if the symbol corresponding to a node is a blank then you are going to have to sum the alphas from the same row at the previous time or the or the earlier row at the previous time and then multiplied by the probability of the symbol this is for a blank but there's a second case where there are only two incoming rows incoming arrows and that is when a character is being repeated right so when a phone, when a symbol is being repeated so when this symbol is being repeated for a, here for instance there are you don't have a skip connection coming into the second e so on the trellis for the second e if you look at the rows uh, i wish i had brought my uh, sword but if you look at the second e row then at every node there are only two incoming edges right and how do you actually identify that you have such a row which has only two incoming edges you check if the previous symbol was also the same symbol as this one in the in the in the fully compressed sequence so if sr is blank or if sr equals sr minus 2 then you know that there are there are only two uh, two uh, rows coming uh, two arrows coming in so in that case too you're just going to be summing the alpha from immediately to the left or the alpha from one left and one above and then multiplying the probability right in every other case you're actually going to be summing three alphas which is the position immediately to the left the position immediately to the left and one above and the position immediately to the left and two above so because uh, consider this one over here this fur the fur could in, in f8 f8 could be either be an extension of f7 or you could be coming in from the blank just above it or you could be coming in from the e right so in every other case you're going to be summing alpha t minus 1 r alpha t minus 1 r minus 1 and alpha t minus 1 r minus 2 so you have these two distinct situations and now the iteration is actually very fair straightforward this is just your standard uh, forward recursion uh, you could from the uh, alpha values in the first column you can compute the alpha values in the second column from which you can compute the alpha values in the third column and so on they just follow this very simple set of rules as you go from left to right and so when you actually go to your uh, forward algorithm which is uh, out here with blanks you would actually have a very simple check uh, you're going to maintain if you if you were writing code you would actually maintain some flags as to whether uh, it has to uh, uh, whether it has in three incoming rows or two or two incoming row, uh, three incoming arrows or two incoming edges and make the appropriate uh, uh, additions now the backward algorithm is also very similar you're just going to have at the final instant you're allowed to be only in one of those two guys only one of those two boxes right and so for those two boxes alone the beta values are going to be one for the rest of them the beta values are zero because you're not no, you're not permitted to terminate in any of the black boxes and then i can begin moving backwards if i move one step backward uh, here is the uh, here is the recursion that happens if you go to go back one step then again any node either has two outgoing rows or three outgoing uh, three out two outgoing edges or three outgoing edges and observe over here that if you're in a blank row there's only one position to go to which means you have two outgoing edges from a blank back to a blank or a blank to the next symbol uh, so also if the next symbol is the same as the current symbol then you have only two outgoing edges to itself or to the blank but if the next symbol is not the same as the current symbol you can go back to your it can go you can transition back here you can transition into the blank or you can transition into the next symbol so there are two cases over here when there are two outgoing edges which is to say if the current one is a blank or the current symbol is the, is the same as 
the symbol 2 down, r plus 2, then you are going to be pulling in the beta values from two positions, the same row but at the next position multiplied by the next probability, we saw this right, plus the same row but one position down multiplied by that corresponding possible probability. And if you have three outgoing edges in the other cases, then you are going to be adding beta values from each of the three edges. And so this very simple modification can now be used to work your way backwards and you can, you can recurse backwards and compute all of the beta values through the entire graph. So this is a very simple modification to your backward algorithm. Uh, the uh, rest of the computation, posteriors and derivatives, are computed exactly as before. The gamma is simply the product of the alphas and betas normalized, uh, except that you'd be using these extended sequences with blanks. So we have uh, all of the pseudocode and computing derivatives, everything else is exactly the same as before. So the overall procedure for training this sequence to sequence model when you also have blanks is this. Uh, the problem here is you're given an input and an output sequence without alignment and we want to train models. And we, so you're just given that it's beefy, but you don't know, you know where each symbol occurs. The first thing you will do is set up the network, which is, which is typically a many-layered LSTM. Second, you're going to initialize all the parameters of the network, including the parameters corresponding to the blank symbol in the vocabulary, which is required. Then for the forward pass, you're going to be composing this graph with all of uh, you're going to be in the forward pass. You're going to be compu you're going to be computing all of these probabilities, which are the probabilities for every symbol in your vocabulary and the probability for a blank. And then you're going you would use these probabilities to compose this graph by pulling out the corresponding rows and uh, constructing the table and including the appropriate edges. And once you've compu computed the graph, you can actually uh, perform the forward and backward uh, computations to compute the alpha and beta at each time for each row. And then finally, in the last, in the last uh, step, you would compute the divergence, the derivative of the divergence for, which is the, ex the, di which is the expected divergence over all possible alignments, right, for every possible uh, so symbol. And now observe that this divergence is basically the derivative of the divergence with respect to the probability assigned to every symbol by the network. And because symbols can repeat in the graph, you're going to have to sum over all the repetitions of the, in the graph. There's one particular symbol which is guaranteed to repeat in the graph. Which one is that? The blank. If you have four uh, symbols, compressed symbol, symbols in the compressed sequence, the blank is going to occur five times. So this summation would be over five rows, at least for the blank symbol. Right? And once we have done this, you have the derivative. You can actually uh, go ahead and pass, perform the rest of the back propagation. So this whole thing, this overall framework that we saw is referred to as the Connectionist Temporal Classification Framework, or the CTC. Uh, again, I'm not responsible for the names. I'm not really sure why it's called what it is, but this is the CTC framework. This applies with the blanks. This applies when uh, duplicating labels at the output is considered acceptable and when the output sequence is lesser than the length of the input sequence, specifically and also when the output sequence is order synchronous but not time synchronous with the input sequence. This order synchrony is important. We're going to move on to the next uh, problem where you don't have order synchrony in a, in, a, in a few minutes. So let's return to an old problem, decoding, right? Yeah. Uh, what if you're trying to predict uh, between uh, like two E's there isn't actually a blank in the input? Like, uh, suppose the input is not going to give you a blank. So as far as you're concerned, you're only producing the symbols, right? 
And the network is supposed to figure out, and here you're assuming you're performing speech recognition, but it could be any other task, okay, right? As far as, the, as far as the model is concerned, it's just A, B, B, C. Mm -hmm. It's got to figure out, and, uh, it's, and uh, the uh, task of the model mm -hmm. is to figure out how exactly, uh, how exactly to characterize the blanks such that in these situations, it explicitly introduces a blank between the two characters. And, it's, and in, in fact, that's exactly what it does, right? So that the problem you're looking at now is we've learned, trained the model. How do you make sure that it decodes things properly, right? And we'll get to that. And this, it turns out, is kind of important. Decoding is a non-trivial problem. And, and fortunately for you, happy you, lucky you, you actually get to implement this in homework three, part one every instance of decoding just to make sure that you get the idea. And uh, uh, so remember, using a trained network, we can, we want to produce, we want to guess what the compressed symbol sequence was given an input, right? So you're given x1 through x8. You want to find this, the compressed symbol sequence. Now the simplest method we saw was this, was the greedy decoding. The greedy decoding just was simply pulling out the most likely symbol at each time. And then after you pulled out the most likely symbol sequence, you were collapsing it, right? Now, in, that early, in the earlier case, we had this problem that because we didn't have the blanks, when you simply collapse things, you didn't know whether you had a repetition or not. But in this case, because you have the blanks, the, you expect the system to be hypothesized blanks between repetitions and not hypothesized blanks. Not, and then the blanks will not be the most probable symbol uh, when those things are supposed to be collapsed. Basically, you want it to learn, you expect it to learn to predict nothing's happening here as an output. Remember, the blank is a nothing symbol, right? You expect it to be able to predict that. And it turns out that it actually works very nicely. This actually does do the job. So if I just did a greedy decode, something interesting happens. It turns out that the network actually ends up assigning uh, in, in, uh, in uh, regions of the input, which are mostly quiescent, where, new, where uh, a new symbol is, a symbol is not ending and a new symbol is not being produced. It actually mostly just produces blanks. So here we have an example. This is from uh, Graves' paper. Uh, where they're trying to perform speech recognition. And uh, the uh, one on top, the, you have the waveform. And I think the dotted line, uh, so if you don't have the blanks, right? If you don't have the blanks, then, you, then, then you're, you're going to have only the actual symbols. And each of the symbols is going to have a probability at each time. So each of the lines in the second, second row represents different phonemes, different symbols in this case. And you can see that in the confusable regions, you have many multiple phonemes having high probability. And you have these probabilities where you have these outputs where some phonemes dominate at, other, at some times, other phonemes dominate at other times. But you really have no way of looking at that dotted line and saying this is two repetitions of a phoneme, right? But then if you introduce the blank, you get the figure at the bottom. And something very interesting happens. The dotted line in the bottom one, the thin, faint dotted line, represents the blank, blank symbol. And as you can see, the blank symbol ends up being the most probable symbol at most times except where a symbol is ending, a phoneme is ending. And it sort of naturally just sort of triggers off when phonemes end. And it captures, you know, it actually gets you a proper mid-level representation. So this blank symbol, introducing this blank symbol ends up being a useful thing, and that the system learns to predict nothing is happening, nothing is happening, nothing is happening at various times, right? So this works. This is, this is very pretty. But this is still not enough. You understand what I'm talking of, about over here, right? So. Uh, but the problem is this is still not enough. Now, we, we, we mentioned a pro problem in the earlier class, which has to do with the fact that the most likely 
time, syn time synchronous output was not necessarily the most likely order synchronous output. Remember? And that is because different time synchronous outputs could represent the same order synchronous output. So to give you an example, uh, we uh, something that one of our TAs came up with last evening. So let us say I have only two symbols, A, B, and then maybe I have a blank, right? So I could have something like, uh, uh, say, two-thirds or like four-six, one-six, one-six. And then I could have something else over here. I won't actually give in the numbers. I forget the numbers. I can have different probabilities out here. And if I just do a greedy decode, I might find something that this sequence is most probable, right? And if I found this sequence to be most probable, then you're going to end up showing that the actual decode must be BBA, right? But then you might, if you, there's only one way of repeating, re, re, representing BBA in this case, that is the only path. Right, there's no other way of, of aligning this input to BBA. Anything else, the two, two Bs would occur close together and they would get collapsed, right? But then if I look at the AB, I can do AB in this manner, right? Or in this manner, or in this manner. So the actual probability of AB is going to be the sum of these three parts. Right? And the probability of this BBA, of, this, of the most likely path, the white path, may be greater than the probability of any single orange path. But the sum of the probabilities of the orange paths can still be greater than the probability of the white path. Right? So which means that the most likely time synchronous sequence is not going to be is not, is not the most likely order synchronous sequence. Here the most likely time synchronous sequence is BBA, but the most likely order synchronous sequence is AB, right? So if you really want to be doing a decode, what you actually want to be doing is to, pulling up, to pull up the most likely order synchronous sequence. But how would you actually pull up the most likely order synchronous sequence? This is an issue. So again, we want to find the most likely, I'm calling it asynchronous, but order synchronous sequence. What Witterby finds is the most likely time synchronous sequence, which is not what we really want and which you must compress. And the, uh, whereas uh, what we really want is the probability of the most likely order synchronous sequence, so which is the equivalent of saying that if I have uh, without even going into the uh, what's on the slide, you are interested in finding the order synchronous sequence. So what is this guy over here? If I just take this, this probability over here is the, pro is the alpha for AB, right? Remember what alpha, the forward computation alpha was doing. If you put all of the symbols in the correct sequence and even had the appropriate blanks, the alpha that you got at the bottom was the total probability of that of, of the target sequence, right, for the given input. And we want to find the sequence for which this alpha term is largest. But so what we would actually have to do, the actual decoding objective is going to be this guy, find me the order synchronous sequence which with the largest alpha probability. Right? Unfortunately, you can't explicitly go through every possible order synchronous sequence in computed alphas. There are an exponential number of these. So we actually need some effective compact way of doing this. Right? And so what we will do is to organize all of our possible symbol sequences as uh, an almost tree-structured uh, graph. 
I am saying almost tree structured because it is not an exact tree, you have things coming out. So what is this graph over here? Let us explain. Now let us say I just have a symbol S I have, the figure on the board is showing only two symbols, but let us say I have three symbols, right? So let us say my vocabulary consists of S1, S2 and S3, right? At the first time, I have to introduce the blank, right? So at the first time, I can hypothesize an S1, or not the first time, the first symbol I can hypothesize. Now we are not speaking of the compressed sequence, what we will be hypothesizing is uh, well, the compressed sequence, let us see. So my first symbol could be an S1 or an S2 or an S3, right? And the first symbol could also be a blank, in which case if I want the sequence to be only S1, I am allowed to either start with S1 or start with S1 and go, uh, start with a blank and go to S1, right? So also I am allowed to start with S2 or start with a blank and go to S2. I am allowed to start with have S3 and start with a blank and go to S3, right? Now let us say my first, say my first, I have sort of got a symbol S1, then the next symbol S1 can be followed either by an S2 or an S3, but it cannot directly be followed by an S1 because if it is followed by an S1, it is going to get collapsed, right? So if I want to, if I want to uh, follow it by an S1, I have got to first put a blank and then put an S1, right? Make sense? But then if I have a blank and after a blank I produce an S2, that is the same as having S1, S2. If I have a blank and after the blank I produce an S3, that is the same as having an S1, S3. Make sense to everyone, right? The same thing happens here. If after an S3, I can produce an S1 or I can produce an S2, but I cannot directly produce an S3. To produce an S3, I have to produce a blank and then I have to produce an S3. But after the blank, I can do, the, if I have produce an S2, then it's the same as S1, you know, S3, S2. If I produce an S1, it's the same as S3, S, S1. So, and I'd have the same structure out here. which is going to be, right? I'd have the same structure out here. Make sense to everyone? But then the same logic repeats after this guy, right? So if from here, if I want S1, I can either go to S2 or I can go to S3 or I can have a blank and then produce S1, but then I can merge these guys. And I'd have the same logic following every one of these nodes. Now here's something special. In this structure, if I look at any node in the graph, the path from the root to that node represents a distinct unambiguous symbol sequence. So this is just my way of representing all symbol sequences in unambiguous manner, right? Make sense to everyone? So the first thing I did is to represent every possible single symbol sequence in the world as a graph in exactly the same manner that we did. Remember, this is just a generalization of what we had when we had only just a simple, single target sequence that we were providing for alpha, you know, for the forward backward. We introduced the blanks and then we introduced the skips and things like that, right? That one is going to be one of the paths the portion of this, this tree structured graph, I'm calling it tree structure, it's not really a tree, corresponding to one symbol sequence, right? This is a generalization of it. Make sense to you guys, right? So now, having done this, here is a, tre here is a trellis I can form, okay? The figure to the left is this semi-tree. The figure to the right is an expansion of the semi-tree through time. Now what happens is that at any time, you can either stay in the same symbol that you are in, or you can go to one of the symbols that you are allowed to transition to by the 
uh, by the graph, by the tree structured graph. And the reason you're allowed to say stay in the same symbol is because we know that repetitions of the same symbol basically collapse. Right? So which means that, uh, so uh, at time t equals 0, you can either be blank or S1 or S2 over here. At time t equals 1, the blank can stay a blank or you can transition from blank to S1 or you can transition from blank to S2, right? At time equals 1, if you're an S1 at this time, the S1 can stay at S1 or it can go into the blank or it can go into the next S2, right? So basically what happened over here, so this you stayed here at time, at, uh, time equals 0, you could be in one of these four guys. At time equals 1, you can just stay right here or transition here or transition here or transition here, right? If you happen to be here, at time equals, at time equals 0, at time equals 1, you could just repeat the symbol, which is basically not doing anything. Or you can go here or you can go here or you can transition into a blank. So basically, if you look at the trellis, the arrows going forward are the same as the arrows in the graph to the left, but one step ahead in time. And then you have horizontal, uh, horizontal transitions, right? Now, the uh, key thing over here is that this, if you look at this trellis, every node in this trellis, right? represents a unique symbol sequence. So uh, basically, more than that, if you consider this trellis, let's look at, uh, so consider this node. Let's say you consider this guy over here, right? The position two to the right and one above, right? There's a graph going from the beginning to that node, a subgraph. That subgraph represents every possible way of generating the symbol just S2 with blanks. So the subgraph from the beginning to any node in the tree represents every possible way of, represent, of generating one possible symbol sequence. And every node in this tree in, the, in, the, in this graph to the right, the trellis, represents a unique compressed symbol sequence. And the subgraph over it is basically, uh, is the complete, uh, is, represents every possible way of generating that symbol sequence. Make sense to everyone? What this means is that now I just have to perform the forward computation, alpha over here. And so, if I had four inputs, if I just did my alpha computation, on the or computation on this trellis, I'd compute the alphas at all of those positions. And now if I want to pick the most likely symbol sequence, I just pick the symbol sequence which has the largest alpha. And this is the most likely symbol sequence where I'm computing, comparing symbol sequences based on the total probability over all possible ways of aligning it to the input and not just the best possible way of aligning it to the input. Make sense, right? So there's one extra quirk that if you look at this last, the, say you look at uh, the final guy in row number four and row number two. One is S1 and the other is S1 blank, right? We have these boundary conditions. At the very end, you may or may not have a blank. So alpha S1 and alpha S1 blank both represent alphas for the symbol sequence S1. So you have to sum those two alphas finally to get the actual probability for the symbol sequence alpha. So for any symbol sequence, there are two variants in the final row, one of which has the final blank, the other which doesn't, and you'd have to sum the two alphas, right? Clear to everybody? Now what, what could possibly go wrong if I implement this? Anyone? The tree, as you go through time, the tree is going to get bigger 
and bigger and bigger and it's going to blow up. How would you fix that? You basically only expand confident directions, right? Which means that you can keep stepping forward at each time you look at all of the partial paths until now and only say, I'm going to expand the top, the best 25 guys I've got so far, the rest I'm going to discard. So you would perform a, uh, you know, this is the theoretically correct CTC decoder. It gets exponentially large. So to prevent this, you would something, have do something called pruning, which keeps the graph and the computation manageable. It may cause, pruning is going to you know, may cause suboptimal decodes because you may get rid of things that will become more probable later, right? But the fact that CTC scores peak at symbol termination sort of, if the way we saw it, kind of minimizes this damage, but you would just sort of, uh, but uh, what you would do is you'd step through time at each time, you're going to compute all of those nodes, but then you're not going to keep all the nodes. You're just going to keep the top K best guys. You're going to throw away the rest of them, and then you're going to, you're going to extend the graph from that point on and keep repeating this, right? Make sense to everyone? Yeah. So uh, this whole thing is called CTC decoding, and this is what we will call the beam search decode. We're calling it a beam because at each time you're keeping maybe the 25 most confident nodes. But you keep going forward through time, right? And keep in mind that the actual computation you would do is probably going to be in the log, in logs, not in probabilities because things will sort of fall off really quickly. But uh, this is just, uh, uh, I have pseudocode, I have, I have pseudocode for uh, beam search. You can take a look at it, but let's quickly look at how this actually works. The pseudocode itself for beam search is very trivial. It's really small. That's about the totality of it. There are four steps here. In the first step, you would be computing the probabilities of all of these nodes at the first, uh, at the very first time instant, right? Those guys. And then subsequently, you're going to step through time. And as you step through time, the first thing you will do is to uh, expand into those nodes which correspond to blank blank symbols. So here, for example, anything that's already a blank is going to get extended. If, if it's not a blank, it's going to be transitioning into blank if the transition exists on the tree, right, on the trellis. So if at this time, for example, it'd go here or here or there. At this time, this would go here, this would go here, this guy is going to go there. You see how that works, right? At each time, you're going to be, the first thing you do is going to be extending into a row that has blank symbols. Then the next thing is, once you've done that, uh, we're going to treat blanks differently from the other guys because blanks have this strange, uh, blanks are special, right? And then the next thing you would do after you do that is you're going to be extending the rest of the, uh, rest of the rows which don't actually have blanks in them. So. Uh, just the ones that are, oh, the arrows should have been here, the ones that are pointed to by the arrows. So you would be extending uh, things at time t equals one, you'd be sort of figuring out how to get to these guys, anywhere where you actually have a symbol, the symbol rows. And then once you've done both, you're going to have filled up an entire column. And then having filled up an entire column, the next step would be for you to just pick the top k best guys and retain only those and continue the whole process over the entire, uh, over time. And eventually, when you get to the end of your input, you remember every symbol sequence can end either exactly in the symbol or have an extended appended blank. So you'd sum their scores. And if you wanted to actually pull the, pull the best score, you just pull the top one. If you are interested in the top two or three or possibilities, then you can always pull the top two or three. Uh, best paths, right? So uh, take a look at the pseudocode because you're actually going to have to implement this for your homework. And uh, uh, skip past the rest of the pseudocode. It's fairly detailed and uh, we've double checked and it's actually correct. So the uh, so story so far, CTC models, sequence to sequence networks which irregularly produce output symbols can be trained by 
iteratively aligning target outputs to the inputs and time synchronous training. Distinguish, uh, distinct repetitions of symbols can be disambiguated by, uh, uh, by representing the extended output of a symbol sequence by sim single symbol by introducing blanks between them, right? And the decoding of the models can be done by greedy decoding, which is Viterbi decoding, which actually works, or doing something that's more theoretically correct, which computes the alphas for every symbol sequence and then picks the theoretically correct, most likely symbol sequence. Except when you do this, you have to take consider the engineering solution of having beams and pruning stuff out. So uh, the uh, Caveats, of course, uh, the way we have handled repetitions is with these blanks. There are other ways of doing it. In fact, there are multiple ways of dealing with repetitions. Uh, this just happens to be the one that was for, you know, somewhat the, possibly the best, most intuitive. And so, uh, and one that was introduced earliest on. And this is the one that, that is most frequently used. But for example, if you have symbols that are partitioned into subunits, there's no need for a blank. If I'm rep repeating the phoneme R, but my units are, you know, each phoneme is split into two, the first half of R and the second half of R. Then if I want to repeat, a ha repeat an R, then this means that the second half of R is going to be followed by the first half of R. If it's just a repetition of the if S2, then it's just the extension of the first, ins you know, first instance of the phoneme. Uh, you can also have symbol specific blanks. If I'm extending an S, I have a different blank than if I'm then extending a T. Uh, now, uh, the actual CTC portion of it is only, uh, is only computed on the output probability table, which means below the output probability table, you can actually have bidirectional LSTMs computing the output probabilities. So there's nothing unidirectional about the portion of the network that computes the probabilities themselves. And there are other such variants possible. So most common applications, things like speech recognition, uh, you know, phoneme sequence in, phoneme sequence out, speech recognition in where you directly try to guess the spelling, handwriting recognition, things like that. Uh, specifically, you know, speech, because you're going to encounter this in a, in a homework downstream. This is what you'd have. The input is going to be uh, sequences of audio feature vectors, right? And you want, to, at the output, you want to actually compute the phonetic label for every vector, but what you really want is something of this kind. You want to say this is the sequence of phonemes that was spoken, right? And for the CTC is the obvious, this framework is kind of the obvious thing to be done. Yeah? If we only wanted to deal with repeating characters, we could have put a blank character only between them, but we somehow put them in between all characters. What the reason is that? The, uh, uh, that's a possibility. The, the problem is when you're decoding things, I think uh, I'll have to think about it a little more carefully. It's a good question. Post it on Piazza. I will think about it and let you know, right? There's almost certainly a valid answer, but I've been up till 5 a.m., so my brain's not working. <laughs> anyway, uh, questions, anyone? So what we are really going to do, because we're going to move on, and this is the lecture that I was supposed to be doing in the past 80 minutes. I'm going to finish it in 10. Um, attention models, right? Again, repeating the whole problem of sequence to sequence modeling. You had a sequence of symbols x1 through xn going in and a different sequence y1 through ym coming out, right? Speech recognition, speech goes in, word sequence comes out. Machine translation, word sequence goes in, word sequence comes out. The number of input symbols, the inputs and the number of outputs need not be the same. And more importantly, you might not have a synchrony between x and y. So what we've seen so far is the first case where speech went in, how I ate an apple came out, the order of the output is, is, is distinctly related to the order of the input. The first portion of the input represents I. The second portion of the input represents eight and so on. 
But if you had machine translation, the order of the output name may not have anything to do with the order of the input. For example, I ate an app for apple becomes Ishaba and an Apfel Gegessen, right? The order is completely mixed up. And in fact, you have things where one symbol over here at eight actually gets uh, mapped to uh, this is Haber Gegessen. So a single sequence symbol in the input gets mapped to two symbols in the output which are not even next to one another. Right? So now you have this really crazy situation which doesn't which is not your standard kind of recurrence. How do you deal with situations such as these? So what we've dealt with, dealt with is the aligned case, CTC. Input and output happen, happen in the same, same order, so they are order synchronous, though they may not be time synchronous. What we would have been doing, right, is this guy here, which is a sequence goes in, a sequence comes out, there's no notion of synchrony, and in fact, the number of input and output, the output number of output symbols may be greater than the number of input symbols, and a single input symbol might map onto multiple output symbols, which are not even next to one another. So in this case, exactly what do we do. This is, now, remember, to, uh, to uh, sort of explain this properly, we'll build on something that we've already seen, predicting text. Given a series of symbols, characters or words, our problem was to predict the next character. Remember, we, we did this when we were uh, speaking of modeling language. So, here, the way we did it was we learned a model that can predict the next character given a sequence of characters, or the next word given a sequence of words, which is to say after observing W0 through WK, it predicted WK plus one, right? And so the problem was something like this. Four score in seven years, what's the next word? You had to predict it, or A-B-R-A-H-A-M-L-I-N-C-O-L, what is the next character? You had to predict it. And the divergence, of course, uh, when we trained it, the divergence was a divergence between the input character sequence shifted by one and the current output, because you're always trying to predict the next character. Right? All of these will come back for our particular problem. And so uh, at each point, the uh, total divergence, if you were using a one-hot representation, was this very interesting divergence, which actually becomes the sum, the negative of the sum of the log probabilities assigned to the next word at the current time, because you're always trying to predict the next word, right? So this is what we actually optimized. But when we were generating, uh, and of course, the whole thing could be trained uh, using uh, back propagation, right? Now, when you were generating language, what you did was you would for provide the first few words, and then having typically as one hot vectors or as embeddings, and the outcome after having provided the first few words would be a probability distribution over words. You're going to have an, if you have a vocabulary of size n, there's an n-valued probability distribution rather than a one hot vector, right? And you were drawing a word from this probability distribution somehow, and this drawn word was being fed back, and that resulted, this sequence uh, uh, was operated on, and the network now produced a probability distribution for the next word, and that word was drawn from this, uh, from this uh, uh, distribution, and fed in, and so on, and you kept doing this till you got to the end of the sequence, right? So, Recall this and keep this in mind because you're going to be using the same thing. Now, our problem is this, ish have I an apple gigas, and I've got to pull this out of, out of I ate an apple. Now, this, a sequence goes in, a sequence comes out. It turns out the way we will deal with this is going to be in exactly the same manner that we dealt with generating language randomly. We're going to be doing exactly the same thing. So the actual problem is this. If you want to look at it like so, this is the network, right? You have a sequence going in. Once the sequence is entirely processed, you want a sequence to come out. 
Now, so this guy here processes the, processes the input and generates a hidden representation for it. This is a delayed sequence to sequence mod translation. And that's just the uh, simple code. And then subsequently, this guy is going to use that highlighted red box to generate the output. Right? So the uh, problem is that every word that is generated, if I simply use this basic structure, only depends on the hidden values, but doesn't depend on what the actual words that were produced at the previous time were. Remember, when you're producing a word, you're drawing a word from a distribution. So I got a probability distribution. I could have chosen apple, I could have chosen, you know, potato, right? When I'm generating the, uh, but when I'm generating the next word, I'm not really considering whether what I drew from the probability distribution. I'm only considering the, dis the hidden variable that actually resulted in the probability distribution. So there's a, no back reference to the word that was previously generated, which is kind of broken. So uh, uh, this means that what we want to do instead is modify, a th modify the thing. This is, uh, you know, so basically when you draw a word at each time, if you have drawn it was A versus it was an, the probability of the next word dark remains the same, regardless of whether you drew A or an. But you would say it was A dark, not it was an dark, right? Because what happens is this recursion over here is only looking at the hidden values. The recursion is not actually looking at what you output at the previous time instant. So to, uh, to account for this, we will modify the model a little bit. We are going to say that the output is now going to be fed back to the input. So there's an encoder stage which produces a hidden representation which is going to be fed to a language generator which works exactly the same as before. So here's a simple translation model. The input feeds into a recurrent structure of this kind. And the input is terminated with an explicit end of uh, sequence symbol. And when the input is finally processed, you get the values in the little red box at the extreme right. And now subsequently, that red box is going to be fed into the second RNN which uses the hidden activation as an initial state to produce a sequence of outputs. So the output at each time simply becomes the input of the next time. And output production continues till an end of sequence symbol is produced. So here's what you do. You would actually use this, the hidden values in the red state initially. And based on that, you would compute a probability distribution from, you, from which you drew a word. And then this guy, this word that was generated and the hidden state are going to go back into the network. You get a new probability distribution, and from that you would draw another word. And then that guy is going to go back in, and so on. So now this is, observe what is happening over here, that the sequence that is being generated, uh, at each time, the word that you're generating, or at least the probability distribution that you're computing, is referring back to the word at the previous time and the hidden state at the previous time, this look a, looks a lot like the NARCS network, if you'll remember, right? If you go back many, many lectures, this was the NARCS network. So this is the NARCS equivalent of a generating, generating networks of this kind, or typically have this NARCS form format. So the actual model itself is very straightforward. You process the complete input, you get a hidden representation, then you plug it into a language generator, and that generates the output. And if your magic works just right, the hidden representation that's stored in the red box stores all the information necessary for you to compute, for you to produce the, uh, produce the uh, correct sentence at the output. The figure itself is very simple. Uh, I'm just using this one, one hidden layer representation that I have above, but you can have more complex representations like the one below, where you have multiple hidden layers and so on. So. Uh, I'll stop over here because it's 1019, the pseudocode for this. Take a look. Uh, with, uh, where, uh, which explains the basic process.
we are going to partition this model into two or we are going to conceptualize this model as having two components. The first is the component that processes the input and generates a hidden representation in the red box. We will call this the encoder. The second is the block that takes this little, the, the representation in the red box and processes it and generates the output and we will call this the decoder. Right? So, you have an encoder and a decoder and the job of the encoder is to learn a representation that somehow characterizes everything that was, everything that was input in one compact representation which may not be possible, right? but we are going to try. And then the job of the decoder is to take that guy and unravel it using the symbol sequence for the output. We will see more of this in the lecture that I will uh, record on Friday because on Wednesday Scott Falman is going to be doing a guest lecture and uh, he is going to be talking about cascode, cascade correlation filters. Some of the unfortunate questions in this week's quiz happen because uh, scheduling problems by my original plan, Scott was supposed to be doing cascade core last week and we have had mess ups. Right? If you have any questions, post on PRs, we are out of time. Thank you.